it's star one nine seven eight story at three seven eight um in this um <clears throat> so last night um there was the pta at the local ps uh q had a um outdoor movie night for the parents of the children um I overheard that there was were children there that were not part of the school that also attended the movie. I can't, I would have no way of knowing. Um, so there's several layers of this story and several layers of appreciation. One is it took an incredible amount of effort of the participants of the PTA being the parent teacher association to put together this one function for the children that attend the school so on that i'm incredibly grateful i could see how much effort they put through we arrived early i asked if they needed help they said no so my son and i sat there i then offered help again they said no so i sat back down um, they looked like they needed extra hands, but they did not. So I did not, whatever. Um, then the, so we had our seats, we saw the screen, it was outdoor night. It was a wholesome event for ju like, just me and my son were there. We were with the community or the society of his age group and a few he's a senior of the whatever. So there were some younger participants as well. People had blankets, chairs, stools, all sorts of seating arrangements. Um, it was very loosely organized in that sense. It was just kind of come as however you are for this one thing we could participate in. So the screen was at the front of the, or on by the school and then in the play yard, uh, surrounded by fencing might i add so security was somewhat intact as far as feeling comfortable sitting in a chair with not knowing who was behind me and only being able to see who was in front of me um these things run through my head at times when i go to these things um so uh it's just me and my son anthony and then people I don't know, a whole lot of strangers, um, a whole lot of languages I don't speak being spoken, N not much English. There was a gentleman to the blanket to the right and his wife who spoke English to their children, but there were several groups of parental units and children that spoke no English whatsoever, and it was not French, it was not Italian, and it was not Spanish. Um, and it was not Latin either. So, um, so I sat there. So I am just so excited. I have this romantic thing in my heart. It's just me and my son. We're going to see a movie. It's a mother son bonding moment. Like just the two of us having, making a memory together. And it's just, it's one of the last before he moves on to another phase of his life that I'll have with him before he moves on. Um, and then I'll be totally alone because then there's no more children left. So there with him, really excited. He's excited. I'm excited. Um, he's in good spirits as am I. Uh, then about 45 minutes elapse and just as the movie is about to get turned on, um, this group shows up with stools that are not at floor level. They're almost like a bar stool. So they're about one yard or three feet off the ground. And they sit directly in front of us. So they're completely blocking the screen. And not only that, but 
then the two children that were placed on these higher stools than the chairs where my son and I are sitting and are in our direct way, um, their parents took smaller stools and faced alternate directions, not at the screen. And they started taking out food and started speaking through the entire opening of the movie. My son's view was completely blocked. He moved his chair to the other side of me, but then they moved, they shifted. He couldn't see the girl moved over a little bit. So I could actually, I had a view of the screen, but they were serving sushi and other food. Um, and it wasn't the smell. There was no smell to it whatsoever. It was the sound, the movies playing, and it was the sound of speaking to one another while the move, I mean, we're there in this outdoor setting as a community and a group gathering around this event of watching this movie, which by the way, is the new, the rise of GRU, the rise of the GRU. I don't know what this reference to the vicious six are. Um, but we are all there in this yard together. And I'm trying to watch this movie about the vicious six in a cartoon, in like a paradox or a paramount way or counterintelligence way. And with some intelligence mixed into it that I have no knowledge of. And I'm watching it and these, and so I'm, do I say anything? No. What am I going to say? The rest of the play yard was taken with people on blankets, people on stools, people on chairs. And it, it was, it was so uh, loosely organized that it became very distracting, very chaotic. And it was very difficult for my son and I to enjoy one of these last gestures of his youth together um, the way, like, I, I just feel like I've been to other assemblies. Um, and again, this is not to say that the PTA is not as wonderful as they are, because they are absolutely fantastic. There's only a few of them. They're not formally trained. They are the goodness of their, it's the goodness of their heart that they put this together. And I thoroughly believe that. And I thoroughly, uh, like, commend them for putting this together and for their participation, um, for which I offered. And again, whatever. So, um, but as a participant watching this scene unfold, it was very frustrating because I was so looking forward to this particular movie. Um, and the fact that it was this outdoor event. Um, and so, it became extremely difficult to stay focused. It became very difficult to hear because the volume was so low. It, it almost required, and there, there was no acoustics to the area either because be, behind the fence that was behind us in semi-secure perimeters, there's the street. So there was, and the motorcycle traffic um, they made their presence known that they were there in the loud rumbling of motorcycle, but it only, I believe it only happened twice. Um, sirens they kept, or the ambulance and police traffic, they kept to a low. There was a police cruiser that was unmarked with lights on that went past. I did notice that. Um, so at some point... It, so it was hard to give full appreciation to the artwork that was being demonst demonstrated at the front of this event. Um, and in my close proximity, it happened to have been this one 
group of uh, two women and then one girl, one male child that I did not know. I mean, I don't know them from anyone else in the yard. Um, I don't even know if they were in the school community or if they're friends of somebody, if they let in just random strangers, if they're part of some homeschooling, if they're part of the city in some other, I have no idea. There's no way for me to even research that. I just walk into these situations and there's some kind of security that works when it works. And I'm hoping that it is working while I am there with my son, Anthony. So, um, so there's that in the background of things that I can't even give appreciation to in that we entered the yard safely. We left the yard safely. And then whatever happens thereafter or whatever took place before, there's not like a formal word I can give. Now, on that note, um, I've heard my whole life that there's something called a war on drugs. That, to me, sounds like there's a warlord and there's a drug lord. And they have some business arrangement I'm not quite clear on. This is the way that I loosely organize it in my ability to just observe and whatever. Then there's something called a landlord. That's the land portion of wherever we are. And then there's the good Lord, which is what I believed in King James Version of Jesus. And now this book as well that I've been perusing um, of the Americas. Because I believe that the original King James Version, from what I've been taught, was in like Jerusalem and like the European area, which would leave one to ask the good Lord, where's my American version in case something happens between a drug Lord, a warlord, the landlord and the good Lord. And I'm stuck out in <gasps> all with children at Starborn. So that happened. That realization happened and the need and the construct of how in the underworld of things, if there's a three-headed dog and there's a one-headed bird and a two-headed bird and some golden black whatever, um, there's the law. I just don't know how they, like what they call themselves. And here's the other thing. When everybody is in plain clothes, like what I'm wearing at this point or some variation of whatever they sell in the local retail store that they're allowing, this level of humanity to gather in without whatever. I mean, they choose their symbolic adornment in pageantry um, for whatever I suppose they can afford. Or if they have a lot of money, they it's so easy to buy lower level clothing and pageant out, whereas the people who have no money have a really hard time pageanting up without intervention and help from the good Lord or landlord or whatever. Um, so I'm, if the warlord and the drug lords minions are dressed in plain clothes and the good Lord and the landlord also have plain clothes minions how am I ever to tell the difference on first substantive contact 
as to who any of these operatives are. And how am I supposed to stay safe and in good rack and pinion position for steering myself and my children out of harm's way and on the good, straight, narrow path? So this way we don't wind up in some pit or competition or have some petition or sham referendum drawn against us. I'm just curious. So being that I've been in a set of rooms, um, and even when I'm in alternate situations, um, I still remain recluse. Um, in the sense of, I don't want, uh, cause, because I don't know who anybody, even if I did know who they were, I still, I have at this point, I see the symbol of the sea and the 12. I see the symbols on my own of the L and the L. I know that there's the testimony of eight and testimony of three. I know there's Josri. I know there's a Yahweh, and I know very little else in how they're running things. What I also see, or uh, c'est voir, uh, voir is um, I have not gotten, like there was no guidance into learning uh, political arts. I didn't even know political arts was a thing. They refer to it as political science, which in retrospect, when I learned that SCI was some top secret thing, I'm like, then why are they teaching top secret classified information to just any country that can get boots or, or, or people in seats with unlimited admissions to just anything? That seems like that's a direct threat to national security as far as I'm concerned at landlord and good lord of, I don't know what the drug and the warlord are doing. I really, I don't. They've got schedules that don't even make sense to me. I haven't seen. They've got some people that work on something called a vice and a virtue and then hold people accountable for things that they don't even know that whatever and whatever, whatever. I don't know who made the schedule. I don't know what form of law made a schedule. Is, is that the market makers? Is that the schedules? Schedulers? Like I, there's a lot more questions I'm left with than answers. And I'm in a place where there's a thing when you cook meat. Um, I don't eat like meat, but I've, but Linda, my entire, Linda does. And she said, that she uses the most foul language and says that there is something where the meat just falls off the bone and they make it sound like it's the most delicious, delectable thing. And all I keep thinking of is, oh my God, I'm going to throw up. Mm. And I don't know what dish she's referring to, but the thought of eating an animal makes me want to vomit. So um, she's saying, she, she says that, and I'm thinking to myself, at age 40, with whatever's going on with gas, oxygen, and the biochemistry exchange of gases and collagen fibers and connective tissue and muscle tissue, it almost feels like my human, um, I'm losing muscular, skeletal, tenacity and tinsel and um i don't know why uh i don't know if it has to do with the fact that the blood just disappeared out of nowhere um for and caused severe anemia i don't know if it's now the repercussions of having lived so long at such a low blood volume i don't know at, at low oxygen um binding properties i'm not quite sure and I don't have a medical staff 
that I can actively rely upon to give me the correct straight answers. So that's frightening. Um, so I'm relying on somebody by the name of Bill Maher, who is in some form of sorcery. He, he, he works for one of the sorcery companies, um, and they put him on the magic machine of the television. So he magically appears, uh, at times and he brings forth these magical messages almost like a messiah in the mess, M-E-S-S, a military exchange S-S for some I-A-H of international, uh, the, is that the AHA Association? I just, that was one of the est things at E-S-T in my life frame with Landmark. Um, just so J-M-G at the Masters of Glen are fully cognizantly aware of the awokeness for which I am like now thoroughly fearful and frightened, which whatever, I don't know how to voice that even more. So I'm watching Bill Maher. Like he is a professor at the university of life and he is like the most important man on the screen. He has my full attention at the moment and he's informing me uh, that there's something in his networked life referred to as a canary in a coal mine and that the coal mine might collapse but the canary gets out that's the moral of the story i'm like that seems really pertinent uh and imperative and so he says this he also says that there's something called a political art and there are participants in this political art, which I did not know. Again, not a career in industry or anything ever spoken of around my person. And then he's also speaking to somebody who had a father who is in a big network. It was Mike Wallace, his son, Chris, Chris Wallace. Um, and they have a very interesting conversation in front of the camera, which is very enlightening that I did not know about the media's beginnings now and what their i mean it's the facts of the media war or information war which i think is an alex jones reference of media wars and information wars also a war i've heard of along with this war on drugs just not quite sure since i don't know warlord drug lord they don't put names on these folks where I on the big board of sorcery and, and then I found out the history through Mike Wallace's son, who was very reputable, Mike Wallace and, and relied upon by generals and most respected people elsewhere. And, and the news originally was a public service to, I, I, it was some agreement, I suppose from the landlord and the good Lord for however the public's being managed. If the service department is worrying and working on drug Lord warlord and whatever they do and working with the landlord. So the people that believe in the good Lord don't get hurt or are able to stay asleep and safe and have nice, lives and things and go about their daily tasks of whatever it is that humans do. I mean, I, these are the things I think about in the, how do I fit into humanity or do I not? How do I fit into God's plan or do I not? I mean, no, I'm written in, I have a special birthday once and then a special anniversary date every year with a very special superstar that I've recognized just recently because it was brought to my attention, who also shares with my very special son in a one sun solar system for planetary. Um, so I'm watching this Bill Maher on this HBO go through the history of 
who Mike Wallace was through Christopher Wallace, but not in like a tribute, but just in like conversation of very important facts are being put between the two of them of things I didn't know. And now like they almost become more valuable than a Harvard or a Yale professor to me in this stage of life and in this station that I'm in, in Bayside station. Um, so I'm going to pull that up real quick because it seemed so menial, but it was so meaningful and powerful in its ability to communicate its beginnings. And then what happened with, um, according to, um, the son, Christopher Wallace, he said his father, they had the public service show that was on at night at six 30. So there was a schedule. People knew when to turn in and when to receive the facts from perhaps the warlord elsewhere to protect them and their children from the drug lord and the landlord or whatever in some other umbrella because who wants to beat up on just one of the lords if there's four of them and they have purpose in their importance and they act in some fashion with the whatever between birds and a three-headed dog and this h-a-d-i-e-s of what do the rest of us do um especially if i don't know how to find the good lord and the whatever landlord um and there's some social welfare being passed amongst the participants and residents, which also I'm not able to partake in. I don't know why. Or they haven't offered me a, a stipend. Like, I mean, I just, I don't understand how to survive these things. And I don't know who would want it out for me to no longer exist in my individualness of one of what's it to you kind of a thing. Um, so as far as operate op, modus operandi, that's just kind of how I go about my whatever, whatever's in, I just, holy crow. Um, so I'm going to pause this and I'm going to go pull up the reference from Bill Maher with Chris Wallace who has the Mike Wallace past participant or past participle that was greatly appreciated, not in an ideological sort of way, but perhaps in a theorem somewhere it may have been misconstrued such a way. And then rules made in, they just keep breaking things. And now they're mentioned that it used to be, you could actively seek out 6.30 PM on the station and there was direct word and facts, not opinions, but facts from someone. And then you could use that in order to self-correct or go about your whatever and function in the populace of not getting hurt between the good Lord and the landlord. Since it seems the drug Lord and warlord are always doing whatever it makes them whatever. So in that circle of life and inner circle of importance. Um, today they said though, that that's been broken. There's no longer like the law speaking directly to a public service announcer who then comes out with a public service announcement at a designated time to tune in. Today they've broken that completely and now there's like a th more than a thousand faces. Nobody knows what law is directing public service announcement to what outlet, to what face, what's approved, what are they up to, how does one participate safely, and it you get news all day long and you don't even know if it's real. You don't even know if it's coming from the law. I mean, talk about mass chaos breaking out. I mean, this is unacceptable living conditions, 
I mean, I, I, it's like living at effect of the human condition in their need. It's, I, I say, I. Now, before I get to the Chris Wallace and whatnot, um, there was mention on the CWS this morning, uh, season 20, episode 30. Um, there is this mention of this gentleman and I see he has on his, it's a fatigue camo, this color, and across the chest it says feel, F-E-E-L. And then he has the sunglasses that I was wearing that I got from the GMA3 uh, concert that I brought Alexander to on one of our anniversaries, our birthday anniversary. In French, by the way, it's bon anniversaire. In English, we say happy birthday. But I don't know if that's your born again every year. I am not quite sure. I don't go that deep into it, but I know it's bon anniversaire. Um, so he, I, and just recently uh, I was wearing that set of glasses and then all of a sudden um, they fell on the floor and they cracked. So one of the arms, so I haven't been wearing them lately, but I do see on his sweatshirt of, a neural network in America that exists, I do see a, whether it's purposeful or if it's subliminal, I'm not quite sure, but it does have significance in my life and message received as far as feel uh, with the sunglasses. So, and he has a tie into something called baseball. I don't know this gentleman by face. Um, never met him before. Um, and he has something to do with the Bears and baseball, B-E-A-R-S, which is the C-U-B-S, because I don't know what that really means in the big wide world of sports. Playoffs get underway. We're going to catch up with a man who six years ago did the unbelievable. Joe Madden led the Chicago Cubs to their first championship in 108 years. With a new book coming out this week, we're going to go home with Joe. See? It says feel and then the glasses. It says the gift of experience. And it has the glasses that I was wearing, which actually I'll go get because they fell off my, uh, I think it was on my hat and the arm broke and I said in a place I can't repair them. So I did receive that message this morning. Also, they showed a message of a girl in Ukraine um, in a collared, um, three button down, short sleeve shirt, um, almost like a golf shirt is what I would call it, a G-O-L-F, because um, that's what they wear on the golf courses in America and elsewhere, I suppose, whenever I'm flipping through the stations and I see them. Um, and she was ringing the bell before school, which I did not know in Ukraine meant um, scholastically they were hoping for peace. Um, they showed some of the bomb shelters um, in the sub base, the sub basement that they have set up for the children if anything should happen. Um, at the St. John's that I took Alexander to where he was baptized. Um, that's where play group was for he while Daniel was in his first, um, first Daniel and Alexander were there. And then when Daniel would go to school, I would bring Alexander for a community group so he could play amongst the other children, um, and get out of the house and have a place for he and I, to interact together, um, since I did not have money, but the church did organize this in this underground facility. Um, so he could be there, um, and be around whatever was in our neighborhood safely in a safe environment, or at least I felt somewhat safe in that instance. All right, so here they are. This is Mike Wallace's son, and this is Bill Maher. And they have this conversation. Um, for me, they're 
more important in this moment than like, say, a Yale University or a Harvard University professor because they're actually teaching me something while I'm stuck in a set of rooms with no access to like a $40,000 or $72,000. I was supposed to go to Northeastern in Boston, just so the Boston Tea Party is like, and I don't really know what that reference is because I'm different type of tea as far as birthdays with anniversaries and a W-E-D and a T-H-U-R-S. Great to meet you for the second time in the <laughs> Welcome to HBO. Can I show you around the commissary? Uh, <laughs> so you're gonna have, we have lunch with a dragon. You're going to love it here, Chris. Uh, you actually are. And uh, have you have you found it so far? Uh, great company, right? It, it is a great company, and I, this is a very exciting hybrid because, on the one hand, as you just said, I'm on HBO Max. Three interviews a week drop each Friday. We have three that just dropped today, and then all right now, FYI, kiddos of like super important like past participants and still being blessed by the gods of drug lords and warlords because I really don't whatever and I'm stuck between it feels like a landlord dispute and the good lord dispute um although I don't know why the good lord would dispute I don't know why the good lord just doesn't go to the other three lords and take it up with whatever 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 and just fix whatever i need for whatever whatever but here we are so um i don't know what this drop means d-r-o-p like i i'm not in on the trendy kid words i don't wear white go-go boots in public on take photos i i mean i heard that that's what rob descent is rob i don't know governor descent is did at the beginning of this whatever and there are still some info wars I suppose going on and some network wars which again I'm not part of any of you I'm in some forgotten about classification of whatever not taken care of real well but expect to perform for I don't know what reason. And the best parts of those three interviews on CNN, prime time, seven o'clock Sunday night. So, so it all came My out family to watch. Is here in Forest tonight. Yeah. Well, I can't think of anybody better to talk about the news business with. I mean, who was more steeped in it? Obviously, your father was Mike Wallace. You worked for, I think your first job was for Walter Cronkite. Well, Job is a little bit of an overstatement. I was his gopher, go for coffee, go for pencils at the Democratic, uh, at the job. Republican convention in 1964, the Barry Goldwater convention. Yeah. Right. And Walter Cronkite, I mean, for those of people who don't remember, this was the last guy, perhaps, that everybody. Uh, just so we're clear, when Lewis had Douglas Bremen at 1800 Northern Boulevard in the premiere location of real estate groups um he uh had this office merrill lynch was in the building as well just so we're clear um at that time there was a bear stearns there were oppenheimers there were clearing houses there were whatever there was and I was attending at a St. John's Episcopal Church at a fish hatchery in the back of a fish hatchery, for whatever that means. Um, being that the island looks like a fish, it has two forks, the North Fork and the South Fork, but whatever on that. Um, and... Um, These things, these just really... I remember when I was a kid watching TV and he was the newsman, and when a comedian like wanted to make a joke about like somebody who had utter integrity, that was the, the go-to, you know? When, when, when I, Walter Cronkite, because it was understood by everybody in America that this, when he said it, we both sides agreed. 
that is a, such a bygone world now that we could even have such a thing. No, I, I completely agree. And in fact, in 67 or 68, he went to Vietnam. And, you know, he was a straight newsman. He didn't give commentary. He just reported the facts. Right. But we were in the middle of this, of this terrible and long and bloody war. And he came back. And despite what all the generals were saying, he said, the war is not going well. Right. And Lyndon Johnson, the president at the time, supposedly said, if I'd lost Walter Cronkite, I'd lost America. Right. And he did. And he did. <laughs> right. True. Yeah. Did, didn't even run again. That's right. But today, the, the, some side, probably the right wing, would just have attacked Walter Cronkite. No, it has gotten so siloed, if you will. Uh, it, you know, you've got you've got conservative media, and they have built up an audience, and they only want to watch conservative media and what it is that 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 uh, you know supports their conception, their view of the world. I wouldn't even know how to find a conservative anything because it's been so many years locked in a set of rooms that doesn't even discuss, speak. They don't even use the same vocabulary as some of the things that he's speaking of at this point. That's how horrific this appearance has been. And liberal media and liberals want to watch that. And, and distressingly, few people just want to get the news and make up decisions for themselves as to what they think the truth is. Well, that's, that's, the, that's a very small sliver of the country, I think, who even wants news. I mean, when I talk to people under 40, even, and I ask them, where do you get your news? Most of what they say is like, well, what somebody posts on my Facebook page. In other words, it's gossip. Where else are you supposed to get information from? There's no reliable news source anywhere. The rabbit ear stations don't even resemble the faces of the law, of the land, of the landlord, of the good lord. I mean, the European oil paintings of Jesus Christ. They have them throughout Europe. They have paintings throughout North America of what Jesus looks like. He is some form of white European looking ancestry to go along with the good book and the word of the Lord in good Lord. So the landlord has one tight reality in order to communicate with the warlord and drug lord to keep all the rest of us safe in some way of managing expectations. Where I am deficient in is why is even this simple, like I had to sit here and think and, and walk myself through where is the significance? What am I missing? What are, what, what is like with the law being wherever the law is doing whatever the law does and with the world breaking as much as it has while I've been locked in a set of rooms with limited exposure to the mentally ill of my own age and other age brackets and trying to look up at the sorcery that wizards and w witches are throwing at me in some vernacular that I could kind of sort of, but not really, if I meditate on it long enough, go like, how does this fit into what I already know to be so, based on the basic training of before the world broke with the crazies that function within it? that earns some form of bread and circus for which I have not participated in in the same manner. And I am not quite clear why I am being punished as harshly as I have been. While other parts of them seem to participate in such a hazardous manner and fa fashion and get away with it. 
It just, it really baffles me. Well, that's, that's to me what gossip is. Your friend is passing around the story. They don't know if it's true. They don't care. But, I mean, Walter Cronkite got 29 million viewers. <laughs> that's, I mean, nothing, no TV show gets even a third of that. Even the biggest hits, I don't think, anymore. In prime time, this was the news. So, and, and if you got 29, Huntley Brinkley got 25 or right. whatever. I mean, you, you had 50, 60 million Americans at a time when the country was a lot smaller who wanted to tune in to see the evening news. But I mean, in fairness, the world has changed. And, you know, you don't get your news at 6.30 at night. You're getting it all day and you can get it on your, your phone or, as you say, Facebook or Instagram or TikTok or what. But what kind of news? Is it directly from the law? Does it have any purpose or is it just to distract and confuse why, while other more serious problems creep in, like turning the gas in the streets on and off? So your like skeletal system starts to melt off your bone, like as if you're being marinated in something you can't even see, but you know that your physical abilities are being compromised and you can't escape from it. Because where am I going to go? Whatever. But uh, it, 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 the world has, has definitely changed, and, and not for the better, in terms of the, the desire to, be, to get the straight facts and to have your preconceptions be challenged by what reality is. People don't want and reality. They want their view. And, and this really all came about because news used to be a, a lost leader for a company. It wasn't Cronkite's day. Um, Absolutely. I mean, with the, the, the giants of, of television back in the day, I'm not... Wait, did, did he just say the giants? Hmm. Like as in the man department. I just, I want to make sure, because I know there's a man upstairs, but I have to have a conversation between a one-headed bird, a two-headed bird, a three-headed dog, some sass that goes on in between, and I really need... To speak to the good Lord, because I'm really frighteningly stuck in a situation that I was not built or designed for. And that, by that point, I mean the, the owners, Bill Paley at CBS, Sarnoff at NBC, they viewed news as a public service and that, you know, it didn't have to make money. It, 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 if it didn't lose money, that was that was okay. But even if it lost a little, that was... That was all right. And and I got to be careful with this because I know you're a huge... See, that's where he said public service announcement. I think at some point, I don't know, but law seems, is, is always playing in the back of my head. But again, is it who owns that title or who runs that department? I'm not quite sure. But I have to think... There's good drugs and bad drugs. There's synthetic and natural drugs. There's chemical drugs. In the War Department, there's chemical warfare, biological warfare. There is then detonatable and pyrotechnic warfare. There's a whole lot of things that go on into that and words I've heard, not that I have any experiential or maybe I do, but by accident only, accidentally. Um, and so that comes into my consciousness in like a, <gasps> in a 60 minutes, but I kind of feel that to a certain degree, 60 minutes and my father were a little bit responsible for what happened. Not that their journalism wasn't terrific, but when 60 minutes went on the air in 68 and then as it became more and more successful, ended up being the number one show in America for a number of years it made money. And suddenly the, the, the executives and television said, you can, you can make money with news. And I think that led to the idea of not having an audience come to you, but chasing an audience. And that led, I think, to more biased news coverage. I do. And I'm not blind to the fact that there is like this tax shelter church thing that goes on in a sidestep of 
used to be in the community when the central was around Jesus and a community leader and a spokesperson for whatever, or a fable storyteller or the whatever it is in sets the precedent of what the country needs to lead their week in like, it's either a Sabbath or a Sabado. Sabado or Domingo. It's a Saturday or Sunday. Je ne sais pas. Non so. So it's, whether you started on a Saturday or a Sunday, there's a week's worth of being led to be good flock, being that you're in a land there's a landlord, a drug lord, and a warlord, and you don't want to get on his bad side. So what is the good lord telling me to do? But even that seems to be broken at this point. I mean, trying to even get enough to have a Sunday's best presentation to the community in order to receive something, just to let someone at the front in their vestments, no, I'm committed, I'm serious. What do I need to do to be a good participant so they don't turn the gas on and I don't die this horrible death? It seems to be a really good motivational factor. Not that that should be the driving force, but here we are in things outside of my control that really frighten me in a real way when I walk around. But aren't you a bigger fan of 60 Minutes than me? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> Listen, isn't that what put food on your table? Did it take your father away from home? Is that what it is? <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, it but, I'm sorry, but, but our time is up here now. No, I, 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 I love 60 Minutes. Yeah. I think their journalism is first rate. What right. I'm saying is it opened the Pandora's box that you could make money from news. Right. And that's the problem, because the media works backwards now. They work backwards from uh, what does our de target demographic want to, how does they want them to filter us, filter this news for us, so that we're only hearing what doesn't upset us. I mean, I don't know if they still have those dials that they use for, like, focus groups. See, in my 70s, being born 70s, and bringing children into the world in a breeding period that started, like my breeding cycle started in the 90s. So I'm a 70s and a 90s chick. Those two 70s and 90s really important numbers for my being a mother and having children, which is like number one priority in my life frame in God, country, and family. So those in that frame of existence between the 78 and then whatever year in the 90s that family was an option or family was the whatever expectation of a high standard and intelligent somebody special that deserved me just as much as I deserve them. Where's the good Lord and landlord in these really easy to fulfill expectations? I just, I haven't felt the reciprocal love between God, country and family since I've been here from 90s on. So where you can tell the people as they're watching, oh, no, I don't like that. I remember, you know, Dred Abbott? Oh, and so he has this understanding of there's something called a focus group. I don't even know what that is. I don't know where they put them together. It's some form of existence that is amongst the American human possibility that was never even spoken of for me, was not some 
place that I was even taught what I was able to reach for or that was even available. I'm learning from him. That's his level of reality. I've never even heard of it before. During the debates, you know, Obama's a little sarcastic. No. That's right. You'd have the, you'd have the blue line and, and, and the red line and then it's the whatever line in the middle. And now they're sharing a reality that at their level of network, of news media, of their exposure to Infowars and network executives, they have the shared reality and construct of how things that they might not witness, how in gossip land, how they're actually functioning elsewhere that I've never even heard of because my exposure to this level of humans has been so nil. Right. And the people who are these anchors on these cable news shows, they know that those dials are somewhere. They don't want to say something that makes the people turn the dial the wrong way. So that's why they live in a bubble, except on this show, of course. And, and by the way, you know, I paid for that. There, there are, you know, lots of woke people who used to watch this show, I know, who don't anymore, because, like, I will present, but I've always, I always did that. It's just that the left went crazier, so I have to do it more. <laughs> And I, I would I would wish they would come back, but not at the price of not calling out both sides. No, and I gotta say, and I agree, that I think that's absolutely true of you. I like to think it's true of me as well when I was at Fox. It is. You left Fox News. At, at, but at, if on Fox News Sunday, I told yep. it straight and they and they never second guessed me on a on a guest or a question. They right. let me do what I did and, and I'm doing the same now at So no, I always thought you were the canary in the coal mine at Fox. I did. I, I now, there's a piece of that sass, I think, is what uh, Jason Aroma, 1976, if he's speaking astronaut for his 0238, if and only if, because he seems to have some following of a sea of blue of whatever that's about, um, I personally would lean and rely more on my 22s that's now walking in my shoes but whatever because he's my right hand and I believe him um once he's fully brought back up to speed of exactly what transpired um since he was locked in a series of rooms as I was trying to not get carved up himself and I participating in a very quiet manner hoping that brother star and grandpa star and the man upstairs was actually working in good concert in order to protect me and whatever in whatever 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 in however they do things at inscribed golden plates at a supper table at the moment that well I've eaten at a Greek restaurant with people and somebody's business manager at the table didn't know that's what who they were because again, there was Tiafreo next to me and me being handed off like some baton in some relay race that humans have been partaking in, like counting down my biological clock in some really insidious, disgusting way for which I don't want to participate. But I really have no choice in this scenario. And they know that and they seem to exploit it and capitalize on it making it all that much worse for my person and my children at this point. I want to see how this metaphor ends up. Well, <laughs> uh, well the canary gets out, the mind collapses. That's, <laughs> that's my <laughs> No, I mean, you got out. I mean, it became, come on, isn't that why you left? Because it just became too hard to be in that money bin? <laughs> you know, I am so excited about who's talking to Chris Wallace. Uh, I am so excited uh, about, uh, about right, CNN right. and just, just looking ahead to the future. You just, you just said you're a big straight shooter, but you would answer that question about I, Fox? Uh, you know, I have found message discipline. I know you're going to be talking to Chris Christie in a moment. Message discipline. That's for politicians, not for us. What? We're 
on the other side. We're the other team. Yeah. All right. I'll ask it. All right. Yes, I'm thinking. We'll talk one, over in the two, commissary. Right. I'm th actually, I was thinking Mitch McConnell just repeat the line over and over right, again. Right. So, uh, last question. You uh, moderate? Done? Yeah, almost. All right. <laughs> I, I'm having a good time. It, it, I'm having a good time. Too. It goes fast when you avoid questions. <laughs> um, but, uh, Don't play. <laughs> but, okay, so yes, sir. I, I think you moderated both the Hillary Clinton Trump debate. One, one of the debates and in one, 2016, one of them in 2020. And also Trump and Biden. Yes, the first one. I mean, it's just a clown show at this point, these debates. <laughs> Is it not? I mean, uh, Trump is going to Trump. He's just this, you know, incredible gorilla buffoon in the room who's going to break the furniture. I mean, it's, it's, it's pointless to debate him. He doesn't know anything. He doesn't care. His, his, his audience doesn't care. He doesn't know anything. Biden, I, I mean, <clears throat> I'm getting more and more in love with Biden, but I, on a debate stage... Just because of the marijuana? <laughs> it didn't hurt, Chris. <laughs> uh... No, he's just, he's just, you know what? He's too old for this shit. That, that should be his motto. He just, he just gets things done. He's like, I'm not sure too old for anything is, is, should be his motto. I think, I think it's, I think it's working for him. He's lean, lean into it. Like Afghanistan, I'm too old for this shit. Get out. <laughs> you know, uh, I'm, I'm second. Here's where I disagree with you about the debates. The, the, the first debate of 2020 where Trump just went nuts. I mean, we had somebody count. How many times he interrupted either Biden or me? 145 times right. in 90 minutes. That's a lot. But having said that, 80 million people watched that debate. So there is a real hunger out yeah. there among Americans well, to, I, we want to see these two guys okay. and size them up. Okay. Well, if I put porn on that channel, I could get 81 million. You know, it doesn't. <laughs> anyway, I got to go. Thank you very much. Good luck here. Thank Welcome you. in house. Thank you. Chris Wallace. All right, let's meet our panel. Now what's interesting is Chris Christie, which is governor or past governor from New Jersey, says something that really struck me. He said he's got two kids, one in Notre Dame and one in Providence, um, $72,000 a year. I'm like, wow, that's really amazing because I don't even have like community college money for my kids. Um and it's a series of rooms and gas gym, like gas, whatever, like real serious stuff. Um, and it's a problem that's not spoken of. And then he said something about, he joked about it. He said um, that he set his kids up to just really like the Mets. So this way they get used to disappointment from the beginning and i was like hmm that really makes sense at this point it shouldn't and then they mentioned something about ginning up and i'm like and again that goes back to this idea of political arts which i've never heard of i don't even know like i mean is that part of the law group of they speak between one and two headed birds somewhere between warlords, drug lords, landlords, and trying to conduct themselves as how the good Lord would when responding to the children that are being harmed, if they even acknowledge such a child exists. It's star 1978, star 8378, Nicole Caterosa. It's Earth, Solar System, Milky Way, Universe, Galaxy is Broken, and it's Bayside Station, Bayside, New York, 11361.